Hi, everyone. Welcome to the South Star Battery Metals live corporate webinar. This is Will Mays with RB Milestone. South Star is focused on industrial minerals and battery metals for the clean revolution, the clean energy revolution, and is currently developing the Santa Cruz Graphite Project in Brazil, one of the premier battery metals jurisdictions in the world, and the Banastar Graphite Project in the United States in Alabama's Graphite Belt. South Star shares are traded on the TSXV under the symbol STS and on the OTCQB under the symbol STSBF. Joining us today is the company's president, CEO, and director, Richard Pierce, who will be providing an overview and operational timeline of the current uh, projects in Brazil and Al Alabama, as well as upcoming investor milestones. At the end of the presentation, we'll open it up for questions for man management to address. If you're interested in asking a question or logged into the Zoom app or web platform, you can submit your question to us directly in the Q&A module. Please note this presentation is being recorded today, Wednesday, April 12th, 2023, and will soon be made available on the company's website at www.southstarbatterymetals.com. Today's call may contain forward-looking statements that are subject to risks and uncertainties that may cause actual results, performance, or developments to differ materially from those contained in the statements and are not guarantees of future performance of the company. No assurances can be given that any of the events anticipated by forward-looking statements will occur, or if they do occur, what benefits the company will obtain from them. Also, some risks and uncertainties may be out of the control of the company. Southstar has a full disclaimer contained in their presentation. Lastly, RBMG is not a registered investment advisor or broker-dealer. For more information, please visit rbmilestone.com. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Richard Pierce, Chief Executive Officer and Director of South Star Battery Metals. Richard, the stage is yours. Thank you, my friend. Great to see you. Thanks, everyone, for being here today. Uh, so I thought what we do is just kind of run through the typical um, presentation, again, for those of you who maybe don't know the story, and then uh, really focus more on, on Q&A and give you an update on where we are in terms of construction and you know, what's happening in, in Alabama. But South Star really is a production story. So we've got the Santa Cruz mine in, in Brazil, which is in construction. So phase one operations basically should commence at the end of this year. So far we're through the end of, of March, we're on time and on budget. And then we've got vertically integrated uh, production in the US uh, scheduled to begin in 2027. Everybody's favorite slide on forward looking statements. You can read that at your leisure. So in terms of the of the company, some of the things I like to, to point out was if we've got a, a really nice uh, diversified portfolio of projects in strategic um, jurisdictions, it is near term production story. So again, we will be producing at the end of this uh, year and then expanding as we as we move forward. It really is a perfect storm for for battery metals. We've got constrained supply globally, um, exponential growth in terms of, of demand across the world. Um, so it really is an unbelievable uh, time to be involved with battery metals and certainly graphite specifically. Uh, we've got fantastic projects with extremely low capital intensity, first quartile of OPEX. Um, we're approaching these things in kind of a, a modular construction design so that everything could be copied and pasted and scaled as required by the markets. This helps a lot with you know, controlling cost, um, operations and maintenance. OPEX, et cetera. So we think this is a smart way to be able to scale quickly. Santa Cruz itself is, is basically set up for three phases. Phase one is 5,000 ton per year. Concentrate plant, $10 million CapEx. Phase two is a 25,000 ton per year concentrate plant, about a $35 million CapEx. And then phase three, again, these are cumulative values. There's a total of 50,000 tons and it'll have additional $30 million of CapEx. Overall, the strategic goals of the company is to have two mines, um, Santa Cruz as well as, as, as Bama Star, each producing 50,000 tons of con, and then a value add plant likely to be located somewhere in that southeast quarter of the United States. Um, we are looking at kind of some trade off studies, but it, it's likely to be located in Alabama. And this basically is, is you know, fully vertically integrated um, production in the heart of what we believe to be one of the most critical um, battery metals defense 
um, space, you know, with NASA, that Southeast corridor is really developing into, into a, a hub for all of these battery technologies. In terms of the, the products itself, again, think of, of demand basically being in, in two buckets. You've got industrial applications, which are high strength steels, refractories, friction products, et cetera. And this is growing at more or less GDP or, or you know, little plus, little, little minus. In terms of the value add components, and again, this is where kind of the exponential growth is happening. Uh, you know, 20, 25% compound annual growth um, year over year. So this really is where the future growth of graphite will, will, will happen. And this includes alkaline batteries, which is to the tune of about 12 billion alkaline batteries are produced every year, lithium ion batteries for cars, for your electronics, for your phones, et cetera. You've got expandable and expanded graphites, which goes into a variety of different industrial products, fire retardants, et cetera, powders dispersion. So again, we, we've tested Santa Cruz for a variety of different applications. We've produced batteries, we've gone through a long cycle test. Um, we know that it works very well. We know that it's highly crystalline uh, structure and low contaminants make it very desirable. Again, the, the idea is that we'll be producing a broad range of products that can be sold into a very broad range of sectors. Um, so if one sector is hot and one is not, we're able to take advantage of those, those times and still be profitable throughout the ups and downs of inevitable commodity cycles and pricing. A little bit about the cap table again, 33 million shares outstanding, uh, 58 and a half basically fully diluted. Institutions own about 7%, 8%. Uh, insiders own about 14%. I am, am one of the largest individual shareholders uh, out there currently, uh, about a $15.6 million market cap at the end of, of March. When you look out across the space, again, I think it's, it really is a, an unbelievable opportunity. Graphite hasn't yet received the attention, certainly, that lithium companies have. But again, South Star is basically positioned to be a producer. And really, there's not that many other companies out there. If you look at a couple of comparables, the, the comparables that are actually moving towards production are worth 10, 20 times what we're worth in terms of, of market cap. So we think it's really a fantastic time to be involved with battery metals. And, and I think there's a fantastic opportunities for shareholders to get in at a very reasonable valuation. Santa Cruz itself, you know, one of the strong differentiators we have in, in all of our projects is that it has unbelievable infrastructure. Um, so we're located very close to three different port facilities. We're an easy day's drive on multi-lane uh, paved federal highways to Salvador, Victoria, as, as well as Ideos. Uh, so again, we can get product to market very easily. Brazil itself also has a very large internal demand. So we can get a uh, product into uh, Salvador or Belo Horizonte, Sao Paulo, again, with an easy day's drive on, on multi-lane paved federal highways. Uh, a little bit about the, the resource itself. We've got a, a really large land package, uh, just over 12,000 hectares. Um, we've got 13 claims. It's very scalable. Um, we are planning on getting out and drilling this year as well to, to upsize our resource and reserve. So principally, Santa Cruz is a large flake, large flake deposit, which just gives us a little better price on the con side. Um, so about 65% of the ore is plus 80 mesh. Uh, and Alabama is, let's say, a complementary sort of, of uh, deposit where two thirds of the deposit is, is fine. So between the two projects, um, we have very complementary sorts of grade size distributions. We've done a full suite of testing for, for Santa Cruz. 30 tons went through a pilot plant. And we've done a full suite of, of, of battery testing, including alkaline batteries, lead acid batteries. Um, lithium ion batteries, uh, again, long cycle testing, we know it performs uh, extremely well and it's highly crystalline with very low contaminant levels. We're one of the few companies out there as well that has uh, product in being tested for nuclear be uh, pebble bed reactor. So, um, you know, Oak Ridge is, has been playing with our stuff and, and testing how it would perform for nuclear applications as well. Really, Santa Cruz is, a, is an unbelievable opportunity. It's a very mining friendly jurisdiction. It's been producing graphite for 80 plus years. We're able to tie into a lot of really deep technical and commercial um, value and then leverage that for, for Alabama as well. It's open pit mining. There's no drilling and blasting. It's at surface mineralization, extremely low strip ratio. The flow sheet itself 
is a very similar flow sheet to the other Brazilian operations with one important exceptions. Uh, we'll be using filtered tails, so there is no tailings dam. Uh, basically, we'll take the water out of the, out of the tails recycle that water. So we'll be able to take advantage of about 75% of, of the water that will be reused. And then the filter cake will basically be, be deposited in with the waste rock. Again, we're in construction, uh, it's fully licensed facility, uh, unbelievable infrastructure and, and a very experienced team of mine builders and mine operators to deliver on, on the production. Overall, the project has been completely de-risked. Again, everything's been tested. Our licenses are all valid and up to date. We're stepping into production, what we believe to be a very low risk, um, high uh, benefit sort of, of approach. Uh, industrial metals is really about developing commercial relationships. So this will allow us to be profitable, just selling concentrate, get product into the marketplace and then scale those relationships as clients require more material over time. A very low environmental footprint and very low environmental risk associated with it, very simple process. We are first quartile of, of OPEX, uh, so we'll be uh, profitable throughout the inevitable ups and downs of pricing. Extremely low capital intensity, especially compared to a lot of these projects out there, which have to invest $100 million in infrastructure, uh, electric, water, power, et cetera. So we're able to take advantage of our location, uh, the existing infrastructure, and the closeness really to um, you know, mining jurisdictions that have skilled people. It's a little bit about the infrastructure again, because I, I think it is such a, an important uh, differentiator of our projects compared to a lot of other projects out there. So again, we're 1.3 kilometers off a multi-lane paved federal highway. There literally is a brand new substation located a couple uh, kilometers away. We have major port facilities such as Ileos, uh, Vitoria, um, Salvador within an easy day's drive. And, and just as important really, is the experienced workforce that we've been able to tie into. So we've got folks that have 30, 40 years of producing graphite as well as selling graphite. In terms of ESG, again, this really is part of our corporate DNA because we have put several mines uh, into operations and then scaled them over time. Um, you stub your toe a lot and you learn, many times you learn more from things that don't work from, than things from that do work. So. We've got in place really um, a methodology that's really based on being a good neighbor, very open, transparent, effective communications. From an envir stand environmental standpoint, again, Brazil has unparalleled opportunities in the sense that the majority of our energy is coming from renewable sources. Where we're located, about 99% of all the energy is coming from hydroelectric um, power. There are some fantastic solar power opportunities out there, which we'll be looking at install it and once we do get up and running. Uh, again, we're, we're approaching tailings in a very sustainable uh, manner, no tailings dam. We're recycling about 75% of the water, which will decrease the fresh water that we need to make up. The waste has already been characterized as inert, non-dangerous, extremely low strip ratio. So ultimately we have a very small footprint. The area itself is mostly cattle farming, uh, et cetera. So it's, it's been disturbed, so again, for phase one, we, we didn't have to you know, take down any trees whatsoever. So again, small footprint, very small impact. From a social standpoint, again, because we've done this before, um, we will be hiring the majority of our, our workforce from uh, the, the local region. Uh, the majority of our managers will be um, located there. One of the great things about the project really is that we're about uh, 90 kilometers away from some of the nicest beaches uh, in the world, so it won't take us too long to really uh, attract uh, folks that, as as we need to, that you know, that will be required as we scale the operations. But again, we're working with the municipality, we're working with the state uh, to basically uh, attract the best talent we can get locally. And in terms of governance, again, we're a publicly listed company, fully audited. Um, a lot of our uh, of our compensation goals are tied to ESG performance. So this is really something um, that because we've uh, been involved in, in dozens of different operations can, and builds and constructions and things like that, um, we know the importance of this. We know how quickly it can go sideways on you. Uh, and we're very proactive and we have a, a pretty good methodology about how we go about this. Really the global markets are in a, a perfect storm. 
uh, we've got constrained supply, exponential growth. Um, Brazil itself has a large internal demand, but if, if you look at kind of what's happening out there, the, the, the lower figures here are kind of the refractories, high strength steels. And again, they're growing more or less at about the pace of, of GDP. And the rust color is, is basically kind of the, just the, the battery applications as it relates to EV. So again, there's a lot of upside that's not even captured here. But if you think about it really in the next uh, you know, few years, by 2025, there needs to be 10 to 15 new mines built. Uh, Benchmark came out basically with, a, with kind of a neat graphic which showed that uh, by 2035, 97 average size mines uh, need to be built for us to be able to meet the projected um, you know, demand. So again, on average, it takes you know 10 to 12 years to get a mine built and, and into operations. We've been involved with this project basically since 2010, and we're basically putting it in operations in 2013. And that's fairly typical. So again, I think this is the year where we slip into deficit. And again, I think it's one of those things where there's not a lot of projects out there that are going to be coming online in, in, in the short term. And we're one of the very few that can bring scalable uh, production to the table. If you look at graphite itself within the battery metal space, again, graphite is number one in terms of percent growth. That's number two in terms of total tonnages. So for my money, it's really one of the, the ideal places to be. And for investors, because uh, lithium has gone up so much in price and graphite hasn't yet, I think it truly is uh, a fantastic opportunity for, for investors, much more so than, than, than lithium is because of all the, 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 the pricing metrics and, and evaluations have just exploded around lithium. Graphite is just getting started. And, and really, I think a very similar thing is gonna to happen to graphite. Brazil is you know, in a really unique opportunity. It's currently ranked number three in terms of importance for battery metal jurisdictions behind China and Australia. So when you look at this hemisphere and you look at proximity to Europe, it's one of the few places in the world that can supply everything that we need in terms of battery metals, including graphite. So again, it's depending on whether Mozambique is or is not producing, Brazil has been continuously uh, producing graphite for 80 plus years, and it's usually number two or number three, depending on what's going on uh, in the world behind only China. China accounts for approximately 70% of all the graphite concentrate and really 100% of all the battery anode material. So again, I think there's a strong impetus out there uh, amongst North America and Europe to be looking to diversify the supply chain and really have a more balanced approach to where these materials are going to be sourced. Brazil, again, is, is a unique opportunity in the sense that we have you know, lithium mines in production, we have copper mines in production, we have graphite mines in production, nickel mines in production, cobalt mines in production. So it really is one of the premier battery metals jurisdictions anywhere in the world. And in terms of the global markets, this is kind of an interesting curve because it, it's really a, a margin curve. So the gray is really producing assets that are out there, the hatch or projects. And what it basically tells you is that the three most profitable operating mines anywhere in the world today are located in Brazil. We're on strike from a couple of those mines. So again, um, that oxide ore deposit, no drilling and blasting, good weather um, at surface mineralization, uh, low strip ratios, again, allows this to happen. And we're able to take advantage of some of the you know, fantastic infrastructure that we have. Again, the, the deposit itself is principally a large flake deposit, about 65% is plus 80 mesh. Again, that just means there's better pricing for con. In terms of resource and reserves, uh, again, 15 million uh, tons of, of, of resource, 2.3% grade. That's very consistent with the Brazilian context. Most of that converted over, so we've got 12.3 million tons of reserves, 2.4%. We'll be mining the first couple of years at about 3%, 3.2%. Um, we do have drills basically uh, getting set up for a 3,500, 4,000 meter drilling program, basically in Q3 and Q4 of this year. Really strong metrics, $81 million in PV5, four-year payback, post-tax, 35% IRR. We've got a fantastic partner in, in Sprott. Uh, again, so we, we basically are fully funded for our phase one CapEx. Sprott provided $10 million. Um, cash for the phase one stream. It's our choice. We can choose between nine and 18 million for partial funding of phase two. Uh, so 
you know, I, I think this is an unbelievable um, financing opportunity that provides a lot of flexibility. We can buy back 100% of the phase two stream. There's an automatic step down of 50% in the phase one stream once we deliver 75,000 tons. Overall, if you look at the, the financial impact of this, post stream with a life of mine EBITDA margin of 51%, it, 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 again, assuming we take everything, attest to really kind of uh, you know how good of a financing this was for shareholders with zero dilution associated with it. We'll talk briefly about Alabama. Again, this was a past producing mine. Um, when, you, when you look at the, at the US back in the 20s and 30s, um, because of global conflicts and, and difficulties in shipping things, again, Alabama was a, a, one, of the, one of the few producing regions in, in North America. We've got a, a nice land package here. So we're kind of located up here. Uh, Westwater and their project is kind of located down here. So we're on the Northeast side of the trend. Westwater is on the Southwest um, side of the, ten, uh, of, of the trend. What really kind of caught my attention about the project was just how similar the geologic context was. So again, it's, it's graphitic schist, um, you know, let's say two and a half to 5% grade on, on average. Uh, we basically just got done with um, a lot of really good work that confirmed our, our, our bench scale stuff. So we ran three tons through North Carolina State um, pilot testing program we generated uh, uh, concentrate so that we're getting ready to send that off for a variety of different battery metal um, testing, physical chemical characterizations, et cetera. We got the maiden drilling program done uh, and we're getting set up basically for another drilling campaign beginning in, 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 uh, in May of this year. So again, uh, the maiden resource estimate will be put out that the, the uh, TR the technical report will be put out basically the end of this month. And then we'll be looking to get a PEA out uh, in Q1 of 2024. And this drilling campaign of about 2,2500 tons will be used to support uh, the PEA and increase our resource and reserves. So this is just a real brief slide on, on the, the, the maiden resource estimate. So again, fantastic result. We got 22 million tons at a 2.4% um, average grade that equates to basically 520,000 tons of contained graphite with a, with a uh, you know, pick and strained 1.1 um, uh, cutoff grade. So again, fantastic results for us. The, the maiden resource drilling program was uh, 12 holes, about 506 meters. So again, if we look at the, the program that's set up for uh, the PEA, that'll be about 2,500 meters. Um, so again, we should be able to substantially upsize our, our resource estimate. And then ultimately for the PEA, which we're, or for the feasibility study, which we're looking to get out basically in 2025, we'll be putting in an additional eight to 10,000 meters of drilling. In terms of the, the, the work that's been then done, again, it's very easy to concentrate, not a lot of contaminants. We got the 97% um, on the bulk sampling, uh, again, we took three tons with very few rougher cleaner cycles. We were able to get the 94, 95%. So the ore cleans up really nicely. We've got 70 tons basically sitting in big bags, ready for a variety of different um, testing applications. In terms of upcoming catalyst, uh, again, we're in an unbelievably good uh, new cycle. So when we look at, at Santa Cruz, it's basically um, construction updates, Commissioning basically starting in October, start a commercial production at the end of, of this year. We are planning to go out and drill again about um, 4,000 meters. So the geophysics team is basically getting ready to remobilize this month. We'll be putting in about three kilometers uh, of a combination of, of IP plus um, electro, electro resistivity. Um, so we did a couple test sections and it lined up really well. We put those results out. Um, on social media as well as in a press release. So again, it lines up really well. It helps us better locate our, our drilling program. So now that we've proven that up, we're gonna go out and do about three kilometers of additional lines and then finalize our, our drilling program. We are working through some optimizations on our, on our value add uh, products, particularly as it relates to some of the alkaline batteries as well as the expandable graphites. Uh, and we will be doing a trade-off study looking at 
purification technologies, be it chemical, uh, thermal, or caustics, as well as shaping technology. So when, when you think about um, you know, SPG, which is spherinized um, purified graphite, basically you're making these oval shape um, snowballs. So you're basically knocking the edges off and then you're rolling it over on itself to make basically spherinized graphite. We want to make sure that we're basically getting the best equipment to be able to have the best yield on the spherinization process. So uh, we think we can get somewhere between 60 and 65% yield. So meaning what goes into the, into the front end of the spherinization product, about 60 to 65% of that would then spherinize and be able to be used for, for battery anode materials. So again, that's part of the trade-off study we'll be doing, as well as looking at coating technology. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of lab work coming up for us. The mining permits for phase two and phase three have all been submitted or in review. We are just getting ready to submit uh, the, the environmental permits uh, for, again, for phase two and phase three, the municipality. Um, we anticipate that we should have all of our permits in hand uh, basically by the end of this year, about the same time that we're commissioning our, our phase one plant. We obviously have a lot of uh, advanced conversations going around commercial agreements and offtakes. And then ultimately, again, the idea is that we will be putting out a bankable feasibility study incorporating phase two and phase three operations. When we did the PFS, it was really um, phase one, phase two. So we've added phase three, taking us to 50,000 tons of con. Uh, and then the board can make a decision in terms of, you know, go, no go. And uh, again, we with the approach we're taking, we'll have a balance sheet, we'll have clients, we'll have pricing lists so that we should be able to get very reasonable uh, financing terms around the expansions. In terms of Alabama, again, fantastic results so far. We got our maiden drilling program done. We got our maiden estimate done. The, te the technical report will basically come out at the end of this month. We are looking to get our, our preliminary environmental uh, characterization done here shortly. We have done our three ton pilot plant. Ultimately, what we're likely to do is take 40 tons uh, of the material that we've already got sitting on the deck, ship it to Brazil and use our plant here as basically our large scale pilot test. And then we're basically getting ready to start the value add, um, physical chemical characterizations, et cetera, uh, getting that kicked off um, this month. So I, I think it really is an unbelievable opportunity for uh, the markets right now. And, and South Star is very well positioned to take advantage of some of the macro trends that are there. Uh, Santa Cruz is basically going to be starting cash flow at the end of this year. Uh, will be first quartile of OPEX, extremely low uh, CapEx, robust economics wrapped around that. It's, it's a really scalable project. Again, we'll be going out and drilling to, to prove up additional resource and reserves. We've got phase two partially financed with Sprott, so about 65% of what we need for phase two is already lined up. We've got a diversified portfolio of projects both in the US as well as, as in Brazil. So when you look at the Americas and the proximity to Europe, uh, we've got a fantastic portfolio of strategic projects that can supply uh, graphite in the short term to these markets. We're able to take advantage of great infrastructure, great logistics, uh, and, and really uh, Brazil is, is, is one of the best um, jurisdictions anywhere in the world for battery metals and, and certainly graphite. We're able to hire unbelievably experienced uh, folks that have been producing graphite and selling graphite uh, for a long time. Uh, and in terms of the timing, again, it couldn't be better. I think this is the first year where there's really a deficit of graphite. We've got exponential growth coming. You look at the U.S., again, the funding potential associated with the IRA, as well as the DOD, the DPA funding, is unparalleled today. Uh, and I think that's you know drawing a lot of interest to the battery metal space, but certainly to, to graphite. And again, we'll be one of the first movers out there so we can take advantage of that funding alternative. Uh, and, and when you look at the United States and certainly North America, Bamastar is today one of three projects in the U.S. with a defined resource uh, estimate. So Again, we're on private mining claims. We're on private property. We're nowhere near navigable waterways. Uh, we think we can get this permitted 100% at uh, the state level. So again, the approach is the same as in Santa Cruz. We'll start off with um, you know, phases, modular approach, 
scale up as required by, by clients. Uh, and we think this is a really smart way to allocate capital. And it's really allows us to get in production quickly. And anyway, we've got a management team that are, are proven mine builders, mine operators. We finance several uh, projects. Uh, we have a lot of skin in the game. Uh, so I think we align well with, with shareholders. In terms of the opportunities in the market, you know, I think graphite is unloved, but that's quickly, I think, going to change this year as, as we're actually in the first year where there's a deficit of material. Uh, so again, whether it's going to do, you know, 10 times similar to, to what lithium did or a couple times, um, I, I feel comfortable saying all, all we know is that for sure the price is going to go up compared to where it is today. And South Star will be one of the first people uh, and companies that can provide material starting at the end of next year. So that's basically the presentation. We'll happy to go through through questions. Great, hey, thanks, Richard. This is a very thorough and interesting uh, presentation. Um, and uh, we are now going to move to the Q and A portion of the webinar. Uh, so if you're interested in asking a question and are logged into the Zoom app, uh, the web platform, you can submit your questions directly to us in the Q and A module. Uh, we did have a few uh, come in um, prior to and during the uh, webinar. So we'd uh, just start off here. And I know you addressed uh, several of these already in the presentation, but it might be worth uh, just delving into a little bit further. First one was on Santa Cruz. Uh, would you mind updating us on the latest uh, geophysical survey results and uh, when additional drilling will commence at Santa Cruz? Yeah, so we 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 put out uh, a press release as well as some some stuff on social media, um, and we found that the combination of IP together with the electroresistivity really gave us um, good correlation. So we ran three lines basically over known geologic sections, and then we compared those to the geologic sections that we had from drilling. So we knew where. Uh, you know, the, the, the ore body was, where there was good grade, where there was waste rock, um, et cetera. And then when we ran those lines, um, we got pretty good correlation really. So the idea behind the geophysics is that it allows us to go out and really target our future holes better so that we're more successful in, in uh, you know, in, in increasing our resource and reserve estimates. So now that we've kind of, gotten a level of comfort around that and proven it. Basically what we're scheduled to do is this month, the team will, will remobilize and we'll go out and we'll put in about three to uh, maybe four kilometers of, of additional geophysics. And then on the back of that interpretation, we'll be setting up our, our uh, drilling program. Uh, so again, we're looking to upsize our resource and reserves you know, ideally, we're getting both deposits to the point where we've got a million tons of contained um, graphite. And with that, we'll have very long, uh, long life uh, mines and, and able to justify the additional capex associated with the value add plant. But so far, really, really good results on the geophysics. And again, we're going to be using that in Santa Cruz to basically help us target uh, our future drilling program. And that's out Great. there, Will, on on. on the company website as well as on on social media those results if, if anybody's curious to see what it actually looks like compared to the drilling results that we got perfect perfect similar question on alabama uh, can you give us an update on the uh, upcoming drilling program yeah super excited um you know I, the the uh the the maiden drilling was so successful again all 12 holes hit mineralized uh, intervals, significant mineralized intervals. Again, we were able to get 22 million tons of resource. Um, so pretty excited about getting back out there and, and putting some more holes into it. So um, unfortunately with that deposit, um, there's some sulfides deeper that kind of distort the geophysics. So it hasn't been particularly useful to um, go out with, with geophysics there, but we're still going to be playing with uh, you know, some alternative sorts of geophysics out there. But the idea is we'll be back out in May, um, same driller, same team, uh, basically looking to put in about 2,500 meters of additional drilling. Uh, and again, the idea is that we'll be looking to kind of upsize uh, that resource estimate to, you know, ideally around a million tons of contained graphite. Again, that'll give us a very 
long mine life and, and the ability to, to uh, uh, support the, the additional capex around the value add plan. And ultimately the PEA that we'll be putting out in Q1 of next year, will be presenting that overall plan of both mines, each producing 50,000 tons of concentrate, plus uh, you know, 60 to 70,000 tons of, of value add material. So compared to what we're presenting today in all of our studies, which is just concentrate, um, this will be a significant uh, increase in both NPV, IRRs, and the overall um, capital intensity, things like that. So this, this should be uh, pretty exciting studies coming out in the future. A couple of questions on macro trends. Um, you know, investors are interested in what you're seeing out there in the market. Are you seeing, uh, you know, more capital being attracted to the sector? Um, things like M and A, things like that. Yeah, you know, I, I think in in general, uh, I think we're kind of in the lull before the the storm. You know, we're at, we're in tough markets for sure. I mean, rising interest rates. Uh, you've got banking crises, you've got Ukraine, Russia, you've got, you know, U.S., Taiwan, China. Um, but interestingly enough, you've got a ton of support being put into supply chain, critical metals, and a more balanced approach. So uh, I was reading today, you know, uh, China put in a ton of restrictions on exporting critical metals. So I think you know, for all, all the, you know, the horrible things the pandemic brought about, one of the great things was, um, you know, jurisdictions, companies, countries, really thinking more about their supply chain um, and having a more balanced approach to where materials, uh, be it feedstock or, you know, midstream, downstream products are going to be sourced. And combined with that, I think you've got in the U.S., you know, the, the IRA plus the DOD through the DPA. Um, so again, the Department of Energy has very cost, low cost loans. Uh, and the DOD, the Department of Defense, through the Defense Production Act is providing uh, basically grant money. So just, you know, again, briefly touching on those things, the way that it sets up basically is the DPA has this year, 2022, uh, sorry, 23, has $1.3 billion set aside. As best as we can tell, it seems like there's 12, maybe 15 projects that, that, that they're looking at out there. Uh, and again, basically it's a dollar for dollar match uh, grant. So say for instance, we asked for $200 million for, for our facilities. Um, they would basically have the ability to write us a $100 million check. And for every dollar we spend, they spend a dollar. So that money has already been budgeted. It's earmarked, it's in the bank, and it's ready to go. So the process is, you know, submit a white paper, submit, uh, you know, a fee, a, basically a, a proposal for what you want to do. They'll evaluate that and then get back to you. They're looking to allocate all of that capital, basically, uh, I would say in you know June, July, August timeframe is is our understanding of it. So again, I think we're very well positioned to be able to take advantage of that. The great thing about the DPA is that they will go upstream to the mine. So in general, the Department of Energy is focused on midstream and downstream. So they want to take feedstock, meaning they want to take concentrate, you know, ninety five percent concentrate, which is what we'll be producing this year in in, in Santa Cruz as well as what we can produce in, in Alabama. So you take 95% concentrate and you upgrade it to 99.95. The DOE is really focused on midstream and downstream. So they want battery anode material, be it uncoated um, SPG or coated SPG. And they have very low cost loan opportunities out there. A few of those awards have already been uh, awarded. So the way they kind of presented um, ideas to us was, for the mine and the investments associated with the mine, um, speak with the with the DOD and the DPA program for those grants. With your downstream processing facility, speak with the DOE uh, about potential loan opportunities. And, and that's kind of the way it, it, it stacks up. So the DPA again has 1.3 billion already funded and ready to go. 
uh, the IRA has to the tune of about $35 billion that's been set up. Um, so unbelievable opportunities in the US. And again, we're one of three projects that has a defined resource. And again, because I think we're on um, a unique set of circumstances on private property, on private mining claims, not near um, you know, navigable waterways. I don't have to do uh, a full NEPA 404 process. Um, we don't have to involve uh, you know, federal um, permitting agencies based on the initial consultations we've had so far. So again, I think we have a strong potential to be also one of the first producers in, in uh, North America and certainly the, the, the US. So when you look at that space, um, you know, phenomenal opportunities associated with Bama Star and, and what we're doing there. Canada just is announcing, I think, 1.4 billion uh, Canadian uh, for similar sorts of, sorts of incentives. And the EU, I think, is looking to do something similar to that. So, um, again, unparalleled opportunities for battery metals. And I think there is a real recognition of trying to diversify their supply chain and have a more balanced approach to it. And again, South Star is unbelievably um, positioned to take advantage of it. For investors today, I, I'll say this to them. Um, again, we're, we're trading at a 25% discount to our cash position in the bank. Um, so you're getting Santa Cruz cash flow at the end of this year, plus uh, the Alabama project for free right now. And yet you're still getting a 25% uh, discount to the cash that we have sitting in the bank. So for investors sitting out there, um, unbelievable opportunity to get in at uh, you know very, very reasonable price. Uh, again, where we are today, I think compared to where we are at the end of 2024, 2025 will be, be very different. Um, so again, I think it's a fantastic opportunity for investors to get in at one of the most opportune moments, let's say. So take advantage of that would be my, my suggestion there. In terms of m and I haven't seen a lot of activity. Um, well, it hasn't been any activity really in, in the graphite space. There are some conversations, certainly in the lithium space. Vale is basically spinning out their base metal operations. So if you look at their iron ore operations versus their nickel copper operations, um, that's a done deal. So the, you know, my understanding is towards the end of this year, basically the copper and the nickel assets will be spun out of Valley and that will be separated. But in terms of big mergers and acquisitions, really nothing happening that I've seen in the graphite space. And there's some conversations around the lithium space, but nothing significant has been announced. Um, there is some funding around royalty companies and things like that, but for the most part, it's been quiet, I think principally just because of the market conditions we're in and, and uh, the headwinds that we're facing, but that is likely to change here over you know, the second half of this year and, and moving into next year, but uh, time will tell. Great, thanks. We're gonna stick with the uh, macro um, questions here. And uh, a couple of questions came in regarding the regulatory and business climate in Brazil and Alabama. One uh, yeah. investor was asking also sort of with the developments of what's going on around, you know, with China, the BRICS, uh, you know, the Western uh, company uh, countries, um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? On, on... Sure. No, I, I think if you look at, at Brazil, I was here again, I'm, I'm based in Sao Paulo. I was here in 2008 when Lula was, was previously president. Um, I haven't really seen any significant um, things to be concerned about. It was fine in 2008. I'm sure it'll be fine now. Nothing is really um, making me think that there's something on the horizon that we have to be careful of. But again, um, it's you know the, the first thing I check every morning is is FX. So uh, it, the it's been pinging around really between a pretty tight range of you know let's say 525 to 540 you know somewhere in that range, and then recently it dropped off. Uh, you know, below five. So again, I think the Brazilian banks are basically betting that uh, the, the, the Fed is not going to raise anymore is my interpretation of it. So if you look at the FX, it's about a 495 or something like that. I mean, we were really watching FX carefully. So again, very blessed to the sense that we brought in 
a huge chunk of cash that we needed at a 540 exchange rate, um, able to take advantage of some of those windows of opportunities there. And, and the great thing about Brazil is that you can put money in the bank in a certificate of deposit and earn a point a month. So we're basically earning, uh, you know, uh, you know, 12%, 13% annual interest rate on a bank certificate of deposit. Uh, so we were able to take advantage of some opportunities there. Um, I, I think, you know, for the most part, we're so far advanced on all these projects and, and uh, all of our mining um, reports have been submitted during evaluation. And again, we should have those in hand basically end of this year. So nothing really out there on the Brazil front that, um, you know, is, is a, a concern at this point. And, and I think the exact opposite, actually. I, I think there's going to be an impetus uh, to explore more, um, expand projects, um, and, and, and really take advantage of this moment because Brazil really does have some unbelievable opportunities. On the Alabama front, again, um, unbelievably supportive uh, um, initiative so far from the state. We were able to meet with both senators, um, several of, of the representatives there. We got a strong letter of support um, from, from the senators to the actual um, DOD for uh, you know, moving the project forward and, and evaluating the funding alternatives um, for the DPA. So um, both from a state level, as well as you know, the, the, the local level, we've had nothing but fantastic support. And again, because we're on, you know, different than let's say the Western US where there's just so much forest service land, there's BLM land, um, et cetera, you have to deal with federal agencies. Um, the area itself is mostly white pine. So this is, is basically, a forested um, area for paper and pulp. And periodically they go in and they clear cut these regions. And you know, once every 20 years, they, they go cut the trees down. So this is not native growth. It's rolling hills, good infrastructure. We're close to some, some population centers there. It's a mining district itself. The marble that comes out of that region is absolutely gorgeous. So again, we're able to take advantage of a bunch of of uh, really good infrastructure with folks that are experienced with mining in a region that is excited about development, um, has experienced folks that we can tap into. I mean, we've had nothing but really supportive conversations, both on environmental permitting, uh, as, as well as the mining front and, and moving the project quickly. So again, I think with all the impetus to diversify supply chains, particularly in the US, with the possible funding mechanisms that are out there, spectacular opportunity. Perfect, thanks. We've also got a, several questions come came in, you know, somewhat related, again, sort of macro related. Uh, the first one was on battery fires. Has that sort of changed uh, any effect or changed the price of the product? Also, um, related question is that there's been a lot of research and development going on as far as new battery materials, new battery technologies. You know, what are your thoughts on uh, the risks associated with that? Uh, so let's, let's split that in two, I guess. Um, you know, when you, when you think about qualifying your material, you know, graphite specifically, let's, let's say we're producing coded SBG. Uh, you know, we're talking with Tesla Ford, GM, um, Volkswagen, Mercedes, Stellantis, et cetera. They all have their different spec material that they want, and they all have their sort of gated approval um, process out there. And the typical approach will take anywhere from, you know, let's say two to three years on average. Uh, and what you basically have to do is show them that your material plays well with all the other materials. So, you know, give me, you know, a couple hundred grams, give me a couple kilos, give me a half a ton, then send me five tons. And so they'll just kind of work through building larger and larger and more and more batteries to test. Because th these battery packs, I mean, think of it like really big AA batteries that have, you know, lots of them uh, 
together that then become battery packs and then battery packs become battery cells. So it basically, it's, it's a bunch of like large size AA batteries for folks that have never seen them that gets stuck together. And then that's basically what becomes the battery pack. So, you know, some of them have different size requirements. Some of them have different, you know, density requirements, purity requirements, et cetera. When, when you look at, at that and all the things that you've got, you know, the cathode side, which is really where the, the lithium goes for the most part and, and other elements, you've got the anode side, which is, you know, whatever, 90, 95 to 98% um, graphite, then the anode itself is many times a, a blended anode between a synthetic and a natural flake graphite. Um, and then you got the electrolytes. You got a lot of physics, material properties, and, and uh, chemistry going on. And the last thing a car company wants is their, you know, a car there's on the side of the road on fire. So, you know, specifically to that question, no, I, I don't see anything um, changing the price of it. And I think it's really going to be driven by supply and demand as we, as we move forward. Uh, and I, you know, the price is it going to be two, three, five, ten times? Don't know, but it's going to be more than it is today. Um, I, I think all the car companies are going to be working hard, really, to um, focus on decreasing that overall time it takes to qualify your material. And you know, if that means standardizing certain certain things or um, being a little bit more flexible on the approach. I think that's going to happen to the to the point where I think in the not too distant future we can get material qualified in let's say eight you know twelve to eighteen months. Uh, but overall, all all the car companies are the same, and all the car companies are basically for the most part third partying their battery production to others. So when you look at LG, when you look at POSCO, when you look at Panasonic, uh, um, BYD. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the OEMs have basically um, used uh, third-party manufacturers to supply their batteries. Uh, and they kind of have this symbiotic relationship, but you know, at the end of the day, it's LG, you know, there's, think of it this way, there's you know, a couple companies in Japan, a couple companies in Korea, and then the rest is, is China. So China is about, you know, let's say 80, 85% of all the battery production. Um, then you've got a couple of companies in Korea and you got a couple of companies in Japan. So that's it for the battery manufacturing. And in fact, in the US, for the most part, it's those same companies which are setting up the gigafactories. And that's, that's really what, what's happening here. So you know, if, you, if you look at that process, I think the trend there is likely to compress the qualification period. It's going to be the same folks dealing with the same processes, but you know, hopefully we do it do it faster. Uh, and and uh, you know that I think that'll be good for industry. Um, what was the second part of the question again? Sorry, Will. Uh, I think you addressed it. it was really to do with uh, the alternative battery. Uh, oh yeah. So again, if we think about alternative batteries, there's 305, you know, ballpark, more or less, little, little, you know, plus or minus. There's 305 gigafactories in construction today worldwide. And they're all, for the most part, being built on traditional NMC or LFP battery technologies. Um, you know, so if you think of the trillions of dollars that are pouring into battery. Uh, manufacturing facilities for us to be able to scale um, this this demand. Um, there's certainly a lot of really interesting technologies out there that potentially could significantly increase performance or even marginally increase performance. But really, the what what I see over the next let's say seven to ten years is more of the same, and then we try to improve the the, the battery technology around that. You know, 10 years beyond, yeah, I think there could be some new um, battery technologies that get adopted. But if you think about the trillions of dollars that are being invested in current plants, plus, you know, two to three years for any new technology or more to be um, tested and proven over time, I think what we have today is what we're going to have for the next seven to 10 years. 
And certainly there's lots of technologies and, and lots of ways to improve, let's say, the existing blends. Um, but I, I think a significant change, I, I, don't, I don't see that in my professional lifetime. And in terms of the battery anode, you know, is it 95% graphite or is it, you know, 90% graphite with some silicon and some others to, you know, dope the, the performance specs? And when you think about it, natural flake graphite accounts for today, let's say 40, 45% of the battery anode for EVs and synthetic uh, accounts for the other, for the balance, let's say. I think as companies, particularly around ESG and, and some of the, the drives toward, you know, lesser carbon footprint, lesser energy, things like that, um, it's likely that basically that relationship will, will invert so that, you know, 50, 55% will be natural flake graphite, which has a smaller footprint associated with producing it versus petroleum products or coal products. You know, it's pet coke, needle coke, those sorts of products that then get graphitized at extremely high temperatures. Uh, so I think overall, the, the anode itself is going to be mostly um, graphite with some other elements thrown into dope to performance, um, likely to be a blended anode. But I, I really don't see anything out there changing you know, really significantly in the next seven to 10 years, um, particularly if we want to be able to bring this level of, of increased supply chain online. I mean, it's just uh, there's... There's a lot of balls in here right now. Perfect, thanks. And we've got time for one last question. Uh, the question is, can you provide some on key points on why now is a compelling entry point for investors uh, and also some uh, uh, milestones to look forward to over the near term and longer term? Sure. You know, I think if, if you look at, at Santa Cruz, it's in construction. We'll have commercial production basically at the end of this year. Um, first quartile of OPEX, very low CAPEX, robust economics, really large scalable asset. We're partially funded for phase two. So again, within the Americas, um, you know, it's, it's one of the few projects out there that will be bringing new material to the markets. And it's really the only one in the Americas. So around the globe, there's a few. We're one of the few. Uh, so I, I think... Santa Cruz is an unbelievable opportunity. Bama Star itself, again, is one of three projects in the entire United States with a defined resource. Again, because of our location, the permitting requirements around it, um, we think we can get that up and running basically in 2027. So we've got an unbelievably, uh, port we've got an unbelievable portfolio of strategically located projects within the Americas. Um, so for companies and countries that are looking to diversify the supply chain, be that you know, the Americas or, or, or Europe, we can take advantage of some inherent logistics advantages compared to bringing material from Asia and other places. We've got great infrastructure that we can take advantage of, experienced workforces. Uh, so again, I think it's, it's a really fantastic mix of projects. There couldn't be a better time in terms of bringing projects online for, for graphite. So again, uh, lots of constraints around supply, exponential growth in demand. Um, we've got some unbelievable opportunities associated with either the IRA through the Department of Energy or the DPA through the Department of Defense uh, to, to be able to help fund these projects at a very low capital cost. Uh, and, and there just really isn't a better time to be associated with battery metals uh, as we move forward through the next decade. You've got a management team that's well aligned with shareholders, very experienced uh, mine builders, mine operators, and financiers. Uh, we've got a very experienced commercial team uh, that is able to place material into the market. Um, the phased approach, I think, is essential to our access. At Santa Cruz, we're profitable at 5,000 tons or even more profitable at 50,000 tons. So there's most of these other projects out there are just focused on battery metals. We can make money on con and then scale as required. Then when we look at funding basically the downstream uh, facility, we already have cash flow, we already have a balance sheet, we've got clients, we've got pricing, so the banks can look at it, financiers can look at it and say, yeah, I'm comfortable around what this is doing. And we can get a very reasonable cost of capital to stand this thing up. And the phased approach allows us to do this in a more disciplined manner that I think is more realistic with the financing alternatives that are out there. So. 
Again, fantastic opportunity for shareholders to get in at a discount to our cash flow. Two great projects, um, you know, scalable assets producing at the end of this year and a team to deliver on it. Perfect. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, everyone, for joining today's webinar. And today's webinar uh, recording will soon be made available on South Star's website. And if you have any additional questions or any questions that haven't been addressed on the webinar, please feel free to email us at uh, southstar at rbmilestone.com and at southstar at mar uh, marvmilestone.com. And uh, thanks again, everybody. And this concludes today's webinar. Thanks again, Richard. Thanks, Will. Thanks, everyone.